Welcome, Michelle. Thank you so much for being here with us today. We are excited to have you and talk to our students and give them some inspiration and some um, insight into your creative process. Um, we'll just start with a couple of basic questions. Um, like, why did you choose to be an artist and where did your interest in art begin? Oh my goodness. So um, mm -hmm. I, I am so excited to be talking to all the high schoolers today. So I, I grew up in Utah County, went to high school in, in Utah County. Um, and so I'm just uh, thrilled to be talking to, to kids that um, maybe are living in, in the same situation or having the same experiences as I did um, in Utah. So uh, with art, I mean, I've always loved art, um, but I never, we didn't, growing up, I never really had the resources to kind of explore art. Oh, look, my kitty. <laughs> climbing up the back of the chair, sorry. Um, I never really had the resources to explore art as a kid. And I remember being a senior in high school and I took my first like art class. And at the end of the, the class, my teacher was like, you have so much talent. I am so sad I didn't know about you because I could have helped you get a scholarship or I could have, I could have done more to help you. And you know, at the time, like none of the women in my family went to college. So I just was like, I, that was just something I, I never really thought about, but that has always stuck in my mind. Um, you know, her saying, I wish I could have helped you and what the trajectory of, of, of art would have been, uh, for me if, if I had more, you know, support or encouragement, but, you know, as a kid, my mom, so I'm, I'm raised by a single mom, which I'm very proud of. Um, and, you know, she did her best to, to get me art supplies and, and do classes because it's something I, I naturally always loved. But as far as like um, growing in my, my ability to uh, get better and improve, it just kind of was a here and there thing. Sorry, did that, what was that the whole question? <laughs> yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, yeah, that's so interesting. And I think that that happens a lot um, where students later in high school kind of come into that creative avenue, you know, through their art classes that they didn't realize before. And so I, I love how um, that didn't it deter you. It just kind of helped to spark that future. It definitely sparked that. And so I actually ended up going to college, which I was, you know, one of the first women in my family to do that. And I was, uh, taking art classes and I was like wow I am good at this and and I and I like this a lot um and then I I um served an LDS mission and um on my mission I was in a really bad car accident and I have a spinal injury from that car accident and when I got home um I was in so much pain could not even hold a pencil or paintbrush it really hurt to put my my hands out in front of my my body and I just I kind of knew that I would wouldn't do anything with art um and so I really stopped doing art um up until about four years ago so wow. and what inspired you to kind of jump back into that so um I I did not see the art that I wished to see. I did not see art that had people that looked like me. I did not see art that represented my perspective and my um, family and my history. And I had thought about reaching out to artists and like, hey, could you commission something like this? But I, I realized that, um, even if I asked them to do something for me and I gave them the idea of what to do, it would always be through their lens. And one thing about being a person of color and um, a daughter of um, a single mother in Utah County was really rare when I was growing up. And so hardly anybody had my, my viewpoint, my life perspective. And so I'm like, I knew it was, it was kind of a spiritual experience. I knew that I needed to step up and do this. And it was really hard because I still have health problems, but I actually would 
put my three kids to bed and I would watch YouTube videos at night and try to learn how to do different things. And that's how I got started. That's amazing. Yeah, I can relate to that being a daughter of an immigrant and growing up in Utah County as well, not seeing that representation. And I think that's amazing that you kind of felt that calling and have been able to um, really create works that are personal for you, but also speak to so many people's experience, um, especially in our state. Um, that is one of my favorite things about being a professional artist and getting my work, you know, in galleries and out there um, on social media is what I love when people say, I can see myself in your work. I can see my, my family history in your work. And, and they've, never, they've never been able to look at a piece of art and really see themselves reflected in it. And there's just overjoy of so much emotion to have people say that. And, um, and, and that's a big driving force of why I, why I continue to do it. That's amazing. I, I had a, a recent experience with that. Um, Esther Kandari uh, has some Pacific Islander um, descent as well. And I just felt that through her work. And um, I, I feel the same thing in yours when I see it hanging in the gallery or in the museum. It's such a powerful experience for a lot of people. Um, how did you choose your specific medium when you did decide to pursue art? And how long did it kind of find, how long did it take you to kind of find your niche in that? Well, probably until I was, you know, 34. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, growing up in school, you have access to, you know, pencils, crayons and, and things like that. And then um, I think it wasn't until I was in college that I did charcoal and acrylic, but the minute I, I started oil painting, it just, it, it felt right. I, I loved it. And my dad actually, as just like a little hobby, he oil painted. Um, and so I, I had his, um, you know, some of his paintings and, and I do have a memory of like him sitting down with me and just talking about how how to start a painting um and so yeah it just i one thing about oil is it's very forgiving and i need forgiving things in my life like pen is really hard hard for me things that i could not erase and adjust and improve on um were really difficult for me i i needed something like and oil is just it's it's so forgiving in that way and um and I'm able to change my mind multiple times and move things around. Um, but the problem with oil is it's very expensive. It's very expensive. It's also very toxic. And so you almost need a dedicated space to really explore that. And for a lot of kids like me who grew up in very small apartments, um, you know, the only stairs we had were the stairs that were outside of the apartment going up to whatever level. Um, you know, there's not always way to have dedicated space. So um, I don't think I would have ever had access to oil painting, you know, as a younger person. So I, I don't know that that makes me sad. I wish there was there was more opportunities for um, these high school kids to have to have access to, you know, different mediums so that to explore. So yeah, for sure. Um, you kind of talked a little bit about your dad and oil paint, and he's showing you a little bit about how that works. So how has your artistic process developed from that? And kind of what is your process? Like how long does it take you to finish a piece? Do you, do you sketch <laughs> so, go from there, you know? Like, so I, like I said before, I, um, I'm a mother of three children. My oldest daughter has autism and she's awesome. And then um, I also have a chronic uh, injury, pain, spinal injury. And so um, that's one thing that was really hard in the beginning is that I didn't, I didn't have training. I was kind of teaching myself as I went. And, um, and so I could never work really fast. And I think that's one of the benefits of 
getting professional training is that you're practicing, practicing, practicing so that when you're working, you, you can improve and get faster and faster. Um, so I was really hard on myself about that, about not being able to produce fast enough. And I have realized that that isn't good to do that. I have a different life situation. I have being a mother of little kids, I, I didn't have a space to work. And so I actually had a sketchbook next to my, my bed at night and I would, and I filled it up with ideas of paintings that I had. Um, and I just knew that one day I would have the opportunity to work those out um, in real life. I didn't really know how. Um, so we lived in a, in a place where we had a unfinished basement and that's where I really got my start in creating works. Um, but then we moved again and just with COVID and everything, like my studio space got swallowed up with the kids and my husband having to work from home. So it's been really hard to find um, a dedicated space, but I can, I, you know, even when I can't work, um, whether it's from pain from my injury or, you know, my responsibilities as a parent, I continue to have my sketchbook and draw out ideas uh, for future paintings because I, I just have a hope that, you know, I'll, I'll get another opportunity to work more. And have you always created the same type of artwork or has your style changed from the beginning? So um, I have always felt drawn to Frida Kahlo, like so many um, Latinas and so many, um, well, everybody loves her. Um, but I remember the first time I saw a Frida Kahlo painting and everyone was like, ew, unibrow, that's gross. But I was looking at everything else that was happening uh, around the painting to the clothes she was wearing, the wildlife that was in the painting or the plants. And it just spoke to me. And then the more I found out about her, she was, you know, half Mexican, half European like I am. She dealt with a terrible injury her whole life. Um, and pain and just the more I, I really learned about her the more I she was telling a story that was familiar to me in my life and my perspective and so I never want to copy her because I know that's really popular for artists to kind of copy her work but I, I am very inspired by her work um, as well as many other Mexican artists just the way that they paint, the colors that they use uh, definitely speaks to me. So I, I am inspired by my Mexican heritage for sure. For your medium or style, what are some of your favorite techniques or tricks? I know we talked a little bit about oil and how um, some of the negative sides of it, but what are, what are some things that you love about it and some tips that you can maybe give? Well, I'm still learning and I don't really know uh, a ton of, of techniques and, and tricks, but I am. I have a wonderful, wonderful friend in my life, um, Kirk Richards, and he I am continually, continually, continuing ugh, to learn from him. And um, he actually has a um, an academy right now and I am a student there and um, I'm continuing to learn all the the right words um, of things and techniques and things to think about um, one thing that is so important I think with oil painting and then with art in general of paintings is composition because the way that you put whatever your subject is on the canvas that is going to tell a story it will either make people feel engaged and enlightened or it can make people feel dark and afraid. And I think the power of composition and knowing how to place things and knowing the colors and how they go together um, is what can really invoke uh, an emotional response from someone. And I think that's just so, so powerful. I love that about music and, and, and arts in general is the ability to help someone empathize to feel a similar emotion or the same emotion. Um, so I think composition is a huge thing to study out and, and learn more about and, and then um, how colors work together and how they can invoke emotion. What is your favorite piece of work that you've ever created? 
So uh, my favorite piece of work I ever created is not all the way done. It, um, I, I have in my mind for many years, I've had this idea of a three part painting and I finished the first part. It was hung in the gallery called Ancestresses. And it was about me as a young girl and um, not really knowing how I was connected to my ancestors, but always feeling like someone was watching over me and looking out for me in my life. And as I got older, I, I came to realize that those angels or whatever, that, that presence that I always felt um, were my an ancestresses. So they my female ancestors that have been watching over me and looking out for me. And, and that's, so that's kind of what that painting is about. But I, um, the thing I love about that painting also is it shows my ancestresses in every color. You know, many people of color, especially in the United States, we have a mixed ancestry. We have ancestors that are all different colors. They're not always gonna look exactly like us. And I never, there's not a lot of art showing mixed ancestry it's always like oh my ancestors look just like this they look just like me um and and I love in that painting that I have I I have shown my ancestresses in every color because that's that is my family history but like I said it's a three-part painting so that's only one so I have panel number number two almost done and panel number three not even started yet but I, I, the three panels uh, will tell a story of times when I felt really close to my ancestresses and my evolution of learning about what is my authentic family history and, um, and how that reflects on who I am and my identity, so. I love that, that is a beautiful piece and I'm excited to see the three part when it's finished. Oh, um, me too. <laughs> one of my favorite things um, that you talk about is that ancestral power to heal. Um, I'm just curious to know kind of about an instance of healing that has taken place either in your life or someone else's life that you know that you feel maybe directly came from one of your ancestors. So um, in, um, in your process of, of your artwork. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with um, November is Indigenous Peoples um, History Month or Native American Heritage Month. And there's a, uh, I have a painting called uh, Family History and Temple Work. And in that painting, um, I show my ancestor, ancestresses, um, I show them going to the temple, like, like the temples in the background and they're going there. Um, on the left side of the painting, I have a woman in with lighter skin and she's wearing more of like a Spanish style folk dress. And then she's holding hands with a very indigenous um, native Mexican woman and they're holding hands. And um, when I started to do my family history, as most, most people of color, do when we start to do our family history we can see there's a lot of racism in our family history um especially you know we are the descendants of the abused and the abuser we are both people um the colonizer and the colonized and i realized that there was a lot of harm that my european ancestors had done to my indigenous ancestors and it, it was really painful for me to learn about that and it was really hard and I was trying to like justify it or weigh it out in my mind about how it worked. And then I, in that painting, I wasn't intending to, but I, I put these two women together and they're holding hands. And, you know, when the Europeans came over here, it was mostly men that came. Most of the women were back in Europe. And, um, but I had this thought about what about all these European grandmothers that never got to know their, you know, indigenous and um, descendants. And what about in heaven? Let's take like the men out of it for a minute. And how are these women, how are these mothers and grandmothers interacting with each other? Because they're all, we're a family, right? We're all family. How are they interacting with each other? And the the thought of forgiveness, well, the thought of acknowledgement and forgiveness and 
um, empathy and humility and all these things came into my mind. And I just, I have these two women holding hands right next to each other as they go to the temple that whatever the men did in the family, that they were able to find peace between themselves. And that gave me a lot of peace. Um, just to, just to be able to, to move forward and feel like, like we're all family and we can forgive each other and we can acknowledge the things that happen and we can move forward in the future. And so that painting was really, really healing to me. And also as a, as a member of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So I, I really, um, working it out through art, right? Like that's one of the best way therapies is working out your feelings through art. And I hope so badly that these high school students that are listening, that they are sharing their unique perspectives in life. Because, you know, I was told, I was, I don't know if I was told, but I felt as if my life experiences were either shameful or less valuable because of the way that I grew up. And I hope that there are students out there who realize that that's not true, if that's the same message that they're getting. And more than ever, their perspectives and their life experiences are so valuable and we need to get them in the arts so that they can share that with more people. I agree, so true. Art is so powerful, not only for the creator, but for the viewer, like we have talked about through this. Um, in, in your process as well, like how did you build confidence and how did you learn kind of to stop comparing yourself to anyone else and to just, you know, build, build up that confidence. Oh, in your that heart. was hard. That was really hard because I'm not, I didn't have the training and I, I knew that and I was very real with myself, but I also realized that if I was gonna, if I wasn't, if I was too soft on myself, I was never going to improve. Like my faces would, would not look right. If I didn't, if I didn't push myself farther, I think, um, talking to other people and being able to take feedback is a, is a big, big thing if you want to improve in the arts. Um, and then I, I was like, oh, I wish I could do that photo realism. I wish I could paint, you know, like, like this or that artist. Um, even Esther, I wish I could paint like her. Uh, and then I realized, you know what? she has her style and that is her voice and that is beautiful and that is wonderful but that does not negate my style or my voice or what I have to say and it's just not comparing I, I admire and respect those artists who have the training and can make beautiful art that touches my soul but I also respect the artists like myself who have not had those opportunities and are just trying their best and continuing to improve. And one of the things I did is I, I reached out to, you know, um, artists that are trained and experienced and asked them for help. And some of them were like, uh, no. And then some of them um, were like, yeah, I would love to give you advice. I would love to give you feedback. I would love to help. Um, I'm sure if any high school student wanted to reach out to Springville Art Museum that you guys would able to direct them to some resources. Um, but you, you just got to be humble and take that feedback but, and just try not to compare and realize you're in your unique uniqueness is your beauty, is your power, um, is what's going to, to touch other people that have never seen their life experiences on the canvas before. Very true. Um, we, we touched on this a little bit, but maybe elaborate a little bit more of maybe what you wish you would have known when you were in high school? Oh man. Um, I wish I would have known that more things are possible than I thought. In high school, especially living in Utah County, there was only so much that a daughter of a single mother would be able to accomplish in my life. There was a lot of stereotypes um, of where I fit into society. Um, being a, a woman of color, there was a lot of stereotypes of what I would be able to accomplish. Being someone with 
out of college education, there was a stereotype of what I would be able to do. And I wish as a high schooler, I would have been more aware that those implicit biases of other people do not dictate what I am capable of. Um, other people's perceptions of what my life was like and who I am will not dictate what I can do. Um, and so I just, I wanna tell any high schoolers out there that are, that are uh, people of color or you know, come from a different sort of family makeup that you might be getting either, you know, um, conscious or unconscious messages about what you can achieve and what you can do. And I just, just reject them, <laughs> reject them and say, that cannot dictate my future. Cause, and I, and I'm living proof of that. You know, I, I, it took me a really long time to actually graduate from college, but I did. Um, but, um, and then it took me a really long time to get into the arts, but I did. And it took me a really long time I think the internet is wonderful. We have YouTube videos, we have social media. Most of my success as an artist has been built on Instagram um, and getting the word out there. And, and like I said, reaching out to other professional artists who are kind and able to help and, um, and asking for that help. Um, just don't limit yourself. <laughs> Sorry, that was a long-winded answer, but. No, that's great advice. Um, yeah, I think maybe we can we can just end kind of in this vein of advice for the students. If there's anything else, you talked about Instagram being a great place to kind of pursue, you know, your art career, um, reaching out to other artists. Is there any other advice that you would like to share with the high school students on their path to, to their art career? Um, the last high school show that I went to at the Springville Art Museum, you know, you can't see the picture of who the artists look like, but I did notice some more um, different names than just your standard European names. You know, there were some more Spanish names. And, and then I saw the work that they were producing and I was so emotional because I felt so excited about the future of art for black indigenous people of color within the state of Utah. And I just, you don't have to be the most talented in the world. You just have to try. And so maybe, maybe you have a little talent, but you're like, Oh, I could never be good enough to paint faces or I could never be good enough to be in a show or a gallery. If you pour forth the effort, if you reach out and ask for help and ask for resources, you can, and you, your perspective on the world, is so, so needed I, and it's so thrilling uh, for us in the older generation to see what you are doing and to see your boldness and for you to share your stories. You know, one of the things I love the most about social media is that stories of black and indigenous people of color are being told for the very first time in history. And um, that is so exciting for me. And so like, you know, following different people and hearing their stories and hearing their life perspectives and things that I didn't know about or wasn't aware of, or, or when I share things on social media that a lot of people aren't aware of or didn't understand and to broaden someone else's perspective so that we can be more compassionate and empathetic and understanding one another. It is one of the most beautiful things in the world. And, and so I just, I, I encourage you, reach out to me on social media, talk to me and I will give you a pep talk and be like, you can do this. Love it. Thank you so much, Michelle, for your time today. Yeah. Um, I think you're such a great role model for so many people, and especially in our state and our students that are up and coming, um, to kind of see that representation and see that anything's possible. Um, and I really appreciate, appreciate your time with us today. So thanks again. Thank you so much.